In 1884, William Koenig embarked on a journey from Germany to the United States, seeking a new life. He found his initial haven in Mountain Home, Idaho, where he established a shoe shop as his first venture. In 1896, William joined hands in matrimony with Regina Kopp, a union facilitated through a marriage bureau. While William delved into the care of a burgeoning herd of sheep near Rocky Bar, his wife contributed her efforts to the farm. As time passed, an enigmatic phenomenon enveloped their sheep operation as the herd experienced an astonishing and unexplained growth. To manage this unexpected expansion, the couple found themselves compelled to employ farmhands. Curiously, several of these farmhands would later vanish under circumstances that raised suspicions. In 1895, a relative of Regina, known solely by the surname Koninger, made the journey from Germany to the United States. Without hesitation, William swiftly employed Koninger as a farmhand. Koninger dutifully served for a year and a half, but then inexplicably vanished within the vicinity of Trinity Mountains Lakes. Concerned by Koninger's disappearance, Koenig began seeking a replacement herder in Rocky Bar, offering the explanation that his former farmhand had returned to Germany. This assertion prompted an investigation by the German consulate in Portland, Oregon. Their inquiry revealed that Koninger's parents had lost contact with him for a considerable duration. Additionally, they disclosed that Koenig owed their son $800, backed by a written note guaranteeing repayment. In response, the German consulate demanded payment of the outstanding sum, but William contended that he had already settled the debt. He, in turn, requested the arrangement of an indemnity bond as collateral to ensure the return of his money. Given the constraints of the time, it wasn't feasible to secure a bond immediately, it would later be delivered to Mountain Home. As speculation surrounding Koninger's sudden departure grew and suspicions of foul play arose, the county commissioners offered a reward of $1,000 for any information regarding his whereabouts. William Koenig was last seen riding a saddle horse, claiming to be en route to Rocky Bar. However, it is believed that he may have actually headed for Trinity Mountain to eliminate any potential evidence. Subsequently, a charred shack belonging to Koenig was discovered in the mountainous terrain, fueling suspicions that Koninger's remains may have been disposed of and incinerated deliberately to conceal any traces of his presence. During the spring of 1900, the lifeless body of a fellow sheep owner named Litzman was discovered along a trail that connected his farm to the Koenig's property. An intriguing detail emerged from Litzman's surviving brother. Litzman was reputed to carry a significant sum of money on his person, harboring distrust for banks. However, in a baffling twist, not a single dollar was recovered from his remains. At this point, William Koenig had already departed from the town, ostensibly evading a court-mandated $500 bail bond related to a charge involving the herding of diseased sheep. Meanwhile, his wife had remained behind, ostensibly to conclude their business affairs. She withdrew $80 from the Rice & Co. Bank, which happened to belong to her nephew, with the intention of later rejoining her husband. In due course, allegations began to circulate that William had potentially administered poison to Litzman, pilfered the money, and left the lifeless body discarded along the trail. Following a brief sojourn back in Germany, Koenig returned to the United States, making his way through Spearfish, South Dakota, before eventually settling on a farm nestled by the creeks of Cottonwood. Soon after his arrival in this new locale, Koenig found himself entangled in legal trouble. He faced accusations, underwent trial proceedings, and was ultimately convicted of pilfering 300 sheep belonging to James Cox. This transgression necessitated payment of $1,350 in restitution and a month's incarceration. In the course of time, Koenig hired a young man by the name of Charles Rohrbecker to assist on the farm. However, Charles mysteriously vanished, prompting his concerned brother, William, residing in Iowa, to inquire about his whereabouts. Koenig explained to the younger William that his sibling had quit, professing ignorance regarding his subsequent fate. Subsequently, William was offered employment on the ranch, where he encountered another ranch hand named Andrew Demler. 
Demler had been laboring there for several months and was known for never parting with his beloved sheep-lined coat and loyal dog. Initially, everything appeared to be proceeding smoothly, but one day, Andrew inexplicably disappeared without a trace. When questioned, Kunnick asserted that Demler had quit and that he had acquired all of his sheep. Kunnick then approached Rohrbecker, urging him to take over the vacant role, to which Rohrbecker reluctantly agreed. The two rode out to the sheep camp, where they discovered Demler's dog sniffing around a pool of congealed blood adjacent to a sled. Kunnick attempted to rationalize the grisly discovery by claiming that he had dispatched a sick ewe and disposed of it in that location, but Rohrbecker remained unconvinced. When the young William inquired about the presence of Demler's prized coat in the shack, he received a menacing response from his employer, who expressed frustration with the barrage of questions. Panicked and fearing for his own safety, Rohrbecker attempted to quit on the spot. However, Kunnick issued a veiled threat, informing him that he must remain until a replacement farmhand could be found. Realizing that Demler had likely met a tragic fate and fearing that he too was at risk, Rohrbecker reluctantly consented to stay. Subsequently, Kunnick abruptly departed, absconding with both horses and leaving the apprehensive William to tend to the sheep. While in the process of herding the sheep, Rohrbecker stumbled upon a washout that offered a route out of the sheep camp. He waited until nightfall and then made his escape. Rohrbecker embarked on a journey eastward toward Fort Pierre with the aim of catching the nearest train bound for Iowa. During his nocturnal trek through the snow, he became aware of approaching hoofbeats on the trail behind him. In a moment of urgency, he sought refuge in a ditch to evade the rider. Once the unidentified rider had passed, Rohrbecker continued his path to Fort Pierre where he boarded a train. Upon his arrival in Iowa, he composed a letter addressed to Sheriff Feeney, outlining his deep-seated suspicions concerning Kunnick's actions. Initially harboring doubts regarding the claims, Sheriff Feeney decided to launch an investigation into the matter, driven by both Kunnick's prior criminal record and the unsettling absence of Demler since February. Feeney journeyed to the farm and interrogated the sheep herder, who insisted that Andrew had voluntarily left for New York through Pierre, a narrative that left Feeney unconvinced. Over the subsequent three days, Feeney made repeated visits to Kunnick's property, diligently scouring for any traces of foul play but coming up empty-handed. Initially, Kunnick failed to recognize Feeney's true identity until a freight hauler made an inquiry about the sheriff's presence at the farm. This sudden revelation prompted William to hurriedly venture out to the creek and unearth Demler's frozen remains, with the intention of concealing them in a remote location and subsequently incinerating them. Unbeknownst to Kunnick, Sheriff Feeney, accompanied by a posse comprising six men and two teenagers, revisited his farm in pursuit of potential clues. During their approach, they noticed wagon tracks leading in the direction of Plum Creek, an observation that struck them as peculiar since there were three tracks when there should have been only two, with one veering off toward a nearby creek bottom. Feeney and one of his associates, Henry Schacht, decided to track these prints, leading to the discovery of a small cluster of hair and recently disturbed earth. A meticulous search was conducted in the vicinity, yet no body was found. Nevertheless, Feeney remained convinced that someone had been buried in the area, and the posse proceeded along the wagon tracks. Merely three miles later, they encountered none other than William Cunnick himself. Feeney confronted him about working at such an early hour, with Cunnick attributing his activities to firewood gathering. Growing increasingly frustrated, Feeney requested Cunnick to dismount from the wagon for a thorough inspection, to which Cunnick reluctantly consented. The search revealed only a broken pocket knife and an axe in Kunnick's possession. Feeney and Schacht had Kunnick mount a horse, and they escorted him to Hayes, while the remainder of the posse continued their quest for evidence of a crime. Shortly thereafter, the posse made a chilling discovery, stumbling upon two dismembered body parts belonging to Demler, located approximately 50 feet from the trail near Plum Creek. While Demler's frozen remains had been brutally hacked into pieces, it became evident that gunshot wounds had caused his demise, he had been shot in the head with a pistol and then suffered additional gunshot wounds to the mouth and head, exhibiting signs of powder burns on his clothing. Meanwhile, Kunnick had already consulted with an attorney from the Horner and Stewart law firm. 
Subsequently, Feeney escorted him to the Hughes County Jail. William Cunnock endured nearly a year of incarceration while awaiting trial. His legal team had secured a January court date after an unsuccessful attempt to change the trial's location, citing pervasive local bias against their client. Throughout this period, he made three separate attempts to escape custody. On one occasion, authorities discovered him in possession of improvised tools, including a saw fashioned from an old case knife, a stove poker, a sizable bottle, and a makeshift club. Following disciplinary action for this incident, Cunnock embarked on a harrowing six-day hunger strike. Desperate and distressed, he even attempted to end his life by ingesting a bar of soap. In a final bid for self-harm, he initiated a brawl with two fellow inmates, suffering a beating before the jailer intervened. Simultaneously, there were reports of a human skeleton discovered at Cunnock's former farm, which, upon investigation, were determined to be animal remains. Ultimately, William Cunnock confessed to the murder of Demler, contending that it had been an act of self-defense. Consequently, he received a life sentence and was transferred to the South Dakota State Penitentiary. On September 3, 1919, while engaged in the task of watering the prison lawn, Cunnock seized an opportunity to slip through an unguarded gate, open to allow some work teams to pass through. Warden Redfield swiftly noticed his absence and gave chase in an automobile, but by that time, the fugitive had distanced himself considerably from pursuing authorities. Notification was dispatched to detective agencies throughout the entire United States, yet Cunnock, with his distinctive German accent, chose to travel exclusively at night, effectively eluding the police. There was one unverified report suggesting that an individual matching Cunnock's description was spotted in El Paso, Texas, before possibly crossing the border into Mexico. Nevertheless, conclusive evidence about his ultimate fate remains elusive.